So I want to welcome back my friend, Andrew Keel. Andrew, if you don't know him, has a wonderful podcast uh, about passive investing in our space. It is absolutely crucial because I feel like there's a giant void in our space, which is conversations about how to be an LP, how to basically back someone else. So for me, I get a lot of questions from folks about how can I start this mobile home park business when I've got five kids or I've got 200 people that report to me and I love my job. Or I hear things like, yeah, I'll walk a park owned home if I have to, but that's not really where my skill set is. Right. And I, Andrew, I know you've heard that a million times over the years. And what screams to me when I'm having conversations with folks trying to get into the space is if you find yourself saying things like that, maybe this isn't for you. And when I say this, what I'm referring to is being the GP uh, in, on a deal, meaning you're the general partner, you're operating it yourself. I think that there are a lot of people over the years who have missed getting started in this space because they wanted to do it themselves rather than back someone else. So Andrew, I am pumped to talk to you today. Man, lay it on us. What did I miss about your podcast? You do so many other wonderful things too. Hey, I really appreciate you having me, Ryan. And and thank you for, for mentioning my podcast, uh, the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. Uh, you know, I think you're exactly right. There's a, a group of people out there where it makes sense for them to invest passively in another operator's deal or fund or what, whatever you have it. Um, because either, like you said, they have a, a W-2 full-time job that they love, uh, or maybe they just prefer to, to do less, you know, and not deal with the, the toilets, tenants, and trash, the, the three T's that us landlords, uh, you know, have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, so, I guess, you know, what I did in creating this podcast was try to give a unbiased look at passive investing. You know, we interviewed an attorney, securities attorney. We interviewed um, a CPA to look at the tax side of things. We interviewed several, you know, large operators. And, you know, the goal was to, to try to find out, hey, what are the most important things that limited partner passive investors need to look out for when investing in this asset class. And uh, it's been a, a really fun project. And uh, I think that, you know, it's provided a ton of value to those interested because there's no other podcast like it. Like I, I remember when you called me, I, I don't know if I told you this, but when you called me to tell me that you were starting your podcast, something in the universe was like, Andrew's calling asking for advice about a podcast. And I was so <laughs> excited when you called me for that. Um, just little aside though, but I'm going to hit you with the hardest question that I think I have in my list of questions today, which I can hear people asking this question. Why not just code GP? Why be an LP? Yeah, I guess the big thing that comes to mind right away is, you know, you don't, know the risks you're taking uh when you're going into your first deal you know a lot of people are like oh i i spoke with someone just the other day and you know he's like you know i think i have analysis paralysis and i said that's probably a, a good thing you know you've never bought a park before you don't really know how to budget certain things and you don't know fully the risks you're taking uh compared to someone that has done this time and time again so I think that's the first step. And then, you know, as you uh, put it on your podcast, like this is not a passive business. You know, even if you plan on hiring a third party management company, this is not passive. There is several metrics that you need to look at and it is a very involved, you know, running business. So it's not like just, okay, I bought a mobile home park. I can sit back now and collect checks. It's, it's the exact opposite. So I think that is important and there are some uh, you know, educational programs and, and otherwise that say, hey, you buy a mobile home park, you pay 10, you write 10 checks a month and that's it. That's just not the case. You know, there's a lot of moving parts to it. Now it's not a complicated business, but it is a, it does require a, a certain level of, 
of hustle, at least at the, the, the grade of parks that we're buying, which is usually, you know, B or C grade assets. So uh, I would say that, you know, even for someone just starting out interested in the space, if they could, I think that it would really behoove them to passively invest in the, in, in the deal first and kind of learn from the operator and, and, you know, communicate with the operator, see the quarterly reports and see the struggles and see the successes uh, of an investment uh, before diving in, you know, yourself. I, I think that's wonderful. And I also have to say too, if you go into this space wanting to code GP, you may straight never get involved. I mean, I, you and I both over the years have had a lot of people reach out, private equity shops, at least to me, oh, hey, you know, we could code GP with you and we'll put up all the funds so you don't ever have to worry about money. And you're like, that's great, but I have like a whole big long list of folks who want to sponsor me. What are you going to do? Oh, we're going to sit on your board. Oh, we'll, we'll do accounting for you. Like you're gonna do a, you're gonna do bookkeeping for me, and you're gonna take twenty five percent of the equity. Like, dude, come on, man. And like, to me, to me, if you're going into this, going, oh, I'm gonna bring real value, and then I go, what's your value? Well, accounting. Well, I'm gonna sit on your board. Okay, you've never bought one before. What do you mean you're gonna sit on my board? Right. So like, unless you're bringing substantial value, and when I say substantial value, I mean like, you have oodles of oodles of connections and knowledge and you're going to do marketing or you're going to do property management or something. The GP side is, is you're, you really need to consider being a full blown LP. Also, you might have to take recourse if you're on the GP side, which a lot of people don't want to touch. And I think, you know, that's another serious, serious consideration is what do you want out of this space? Because to your point, I, and like we say on my podcast all the time, oh my gosh, it is a ton of work. I mean, I've got messes I got to clean up all the time. That's real estate in general. So if you really truly want mailbox money or I'm willing to do work, right? Like if you really truly want something mailbox, that's being a limited partner. Um, and also just quick before I ask my next question, I totally agree about third party management companies, even some of the bigger ones. I have had people reach out to me all the time about messes that third-party management companies leave behind. Uh, I'm actually working one-on-one -on -one with a friend of ours right now, helping him fire them and hire his own and grow his own company because he's like, dude, they've left me a hot mess. Um, so in other words, it's tough. Being a GP comes with a lot of risk, like you said, which I love. Talk to me about some more pros of that exists by being an LP. Yeah, definitely. So I think, you know, when you're an LP, not only are you able to take advantage of some of the upside, right, that, that the deal is offering by participating in a share of the equity, uh, but you also, your downside risk is, is limited to your investment amount. You know, like you said, the GPs are, you know, signing recourse on the debt more than likely upon acquisition, especially with value add deals. So you're able to partake in, you know, some of that, uh, upside when they do add the value. Uh, you know, and I think the big thing is, is this is affordable housing and there are toilets, tenants and trash issues that come about. Um, and I think that is, you know, at least for the LPs that I speak with, you know, that is something that they're just not ready to, uh, not ready to handle themselves 100%. They would rather invest as an LP, get the tax benefits, uh, get, you know, the, the income and just basically be limited in, in their management of the asset. So when you say tax benefits, you mean stuff like opportunity zones, bonus depreciation, all that stuff as an LP, you can take advantage of. So you're not missing that by not sitting on the GP side. Exactly. So it'll roll down to their K1. And when they get those K1s and there's a negative number on there uh, and they, you know, they send me an email saying, Hey, you know, you guys crushed it. Great job. Uh, they, that's something that they're able to partake in and awesome. it, it, it offsets some of their other income. And uh, it's, you know, it, it's a really cool piece. I, you know, I've passively invested in other operators deals and uh you know, it's, it's a, it's a different side of the table, right? Uh, but there's a common goal and, and it's, it's fun to uh, see assets that are, 
you know, uh, just have deferred maintenance and struggling in some aspects. And then to see what an infusion of capital can do to the asset uh, is fun, you know, and it's, it's, it's even better when other people are doing the, doing the blood, sweat and tears part. Yeah, I've got one passive investment right now. And I got to say every now and again, when I hear about something going on on the property, I get that feeling like, oh, such and such is threatening not to pay rent or, oh, such and such is parking his big truck and truck attachment on Miss Penny's yard. And I'm like, oh man, I'm going to have to call this person and oh wait, no, I don't. (laughs) It's definitely, definitely nice to be, to be an LP, but let's play devil's advocate for a minute. What are you giving up by being an LP? You're giving up control. I think that's the big part is, you know, there, there's a lot of trust on the LP side in the GPs and all the way down to, you know, the line items on the P&L, you know, you're, you're giving them trust with your money that they're going to be a fiduciary, you know, in the property and treat the property the way you would. And, uh, you know, it's tough. You know, I've heard stories. Uh, luckily, you know, our LPs, uh, haven't done this, but you know, stories of investors going through the P and L and going line item by line item, asking questions about, Hey, you know, why'd you spend, you know, $65 on a microwave? You know, why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? Uh, and it's, it's, it's not about that. It's about, you know, being, being passive, but trusting the other party because they've, you know, they've done this before. They know what they're doing and they're gonna, they're gonna do what's right. Uh, in, in regards to managing the assets. So that, that's what I'd say. So I personally think there are so many great, wonderful folks who would do wonderful things in our space that have missed the boat because they were unwilling to be an LP. So you and I totally agree on this. It is okay to be an LP, especially for your first deal, because there's this beautiful thing that happens when you are an owner of a mobile home park. And that is, you are now the owner of a mobile home park. Your conversations with brokers will be different. Sellers will be different. All of the above, when you just go from zero to one, it makes a colossal difference. Yeah, It's huge. Ian and I, our first deal ever, we were LPs. So uh, it's a great way to get in. So let's let's pivot here for a minute and let's... let's, let's pretend that I want to be an LP. What are some of the seemingly really relevant questions to ask? Like what are the kind of just the FAQs that seem like are really important, but at the end of the day, I I really should be asking something else. What are some like really basic questions that I. Yeah. Great, great point. So through my podcast, I learned a lot myself just through interviewing rock stars in the space that are, you know, other operators and then other passive investors as well and learning like what some of their mistakes were and so forth. So one of the things that really jumped out at me that was a quote, uh, I forget at the moment who said it, but they said that a good operator can make a bad deal good and a bad operator can make a good deal bad. And when you, when you step back and you think about that, it makes all the sense in the world. So your questions initially should be geared towards that operator and doing due diligence on them and looking into their case studies and, and verifying, you know, what they're, what they're telling you. And I think that is where a lot of newer limited partner investors, uh, either they don't do enough due diligence on the operator or they're so caught up on the specifics of the property in how many vacant lots there are and what the age of the homes are and, you know, the Metro statistics, they're so caught up on the property specific details that they're missing the picture in regards to the operator and their wherewithal to execute the business plan. If that makes sense. I love that. I, I want to, our mutual friend, I want to mention our mutual friend, Ryan Smith right now, because when he came on, he, on my podcast, he said, I don't do pro formas. <laughs> it's like I have one, but that's not what I'm using to sell someone on investing with me. And I think to me that screams, I know what I'm doing because anybody can hide behind a pro forma and talk about the MSA. They can talk about this side of the other thing. To me, when I started out, I was like, if it's not Charlotte, Atlanta, Charleston, big city, I'm not in. 
you've definitely bought some more secondary and tertiary markets and have crushed it. And what that means to me is you know what you're doing because you can make money in the middle of the nowhere. Like there's dollar generals and Walmarts and all sorts of stuff that are making money in rural America. The difference is what you just said. Do they know what they're doing? So Andrew, what types of, so what types of things should I be looking out for? Cause me personally, I know exactly what I would ask, but for someone who's completely fresh, maybe they've listened to some podcasts, maybe went to a boot camp. like what other non obvious questions should they be asking or what should they be looking for? Yeah. So I, I would always start out a conversation talking about liquidity because mm. I think that's one of the big things here that a lot of newer, uh, real estate private equity investors don't realize is that you know real estate is naturally illiquid right so when we're in, when you're investing in these deals you're typically not going to be able to buy and sell like a stock you're not going to be able to liquidate your investment you know quickly as if you were you know investing in a stock so i think that is one thing that makes things different now there are things called reits uh real estate investment trusts and i i discussed this on my podcast which are ways for investors to invest into you know, mobile home parks uh, that are operated by big, huge operators. And those are liquid. You know, those are bought and sold like a stock. Uh, however, you know, some of the better returns, you know, potentially, I gotta, I gotta use my SEC language, potentially could be found in syndications or investment funds or otherwise. So, you know, the liquidity is an issue if you're trying to like put money in and take money out and trade it like Bitcoin, this is not going to be an investment for you. These are, you're going to have to read the business plan, understand the business plan and see, okay, they're going to buy the asset. They're going to invest X amount of dollars. They're going to improve the asset. And then the exit plan is a refinance at, you know, year five. And then that's when the initial capital will be paid back. So I think, I think most investors should start there and make sure they're comfortable with that that liquidity or illiquid nature of real estate, private equity upfront, and then understand when, when they're going to be able to get their capital back and at what return, right? I mean, return is obviously the, the sexy uh, number that, that everybody likes. And you can see, I, you know, I get a bunch of these fundrise ads on my Facebook page now because I, I look through some of those deals at times and all they, all they discuss is the potential IRR. And just like you said with Ryan Smith, he doesn't even do a, a pro forma that he shows investors <laughs> because he knows that, you know, most of those pro formas, you know, will go off track at some point right. because of X, Y, and Z that comes up because it's, it's real estate. So um, yeah, I would, I would make sure you understand what the liquidity is after you're okay with the operator and you've vetted the operator and, you know, uh, you've spoken maybe with a couple of their investors that have invested with them prior. I think that's a huge thing that is not done enough, you know, ask them for someone that's invested with them prior and get a, get a reference on them. Uh, and then, you know, look through some of their case studies, but we start with liquidity. We look at returns and then, uh, you know, also you should make sure that you understand what their niche is. You know, like you said earlier, you, your niche is a lot different than the Midwest, which is, is kind of where we've put our footprint. And, you know, if, if, the, if they don't specialize in something, that should be somewhat of a red flag because yeah. the operators that I speak with that are like, you know, oh, we, we buy this, that, and, and everything in between. You know, I, I think that they're, for lack of a better word, inexperienced and newer and just trying to get what they can, what they can close. Uh, but at the same time, they may not be thinking and they may not realize, like I talked about originally, they may not realize some of the risks they're taking by buying a four lot mobile home park in the middle of Montana when they live in, you know, Orlando, Florida. They're just things like that that don't make sense. Yeah, I love that answer. Liquidity is huge. Obviously, anybody who's gone to business school or has heard of business school knows cash is king. And you're buying an illiquid asset. I mean, these are, these are not current assets, right? So you're taking on a liquidity risk. And that's why there are things like 8% preferred returns because you need to get paid, right? Because you can't just open up your Robinhood app and sell something, right? <laughs> Although that's, a, that's another conversation for another day. Um, 
they're not stonks, right? Uh, yeah. If you follow the internet, and and I love, and I want to just shout from the mountaintop what you just said about a lack of a unique strategy. I see so many people raising so much money, and when I ask them what they want to do, they're like, "Well, you know, if it's a good deal, I'll look at it." It's like, what does that mean? You know, like you have a very specific strategy, and so do I. And I say no to probably probably like over ninety percent of what I look at. I say no to. And it's because I have a really specific strategy and it's worked extraordinarily well. Now, like now that I'm kind of, you know, like about where I've, I've almost hit my goal, I'm starting to experiment with other things, which is fun, but I would never take on outside money to go and do something I've never done before. Um, so I, I love that. One other piece I'd kind of like to dive a little bit deeper into, cause I don't, I don't know if folks ever really ask this and correct me if I'm wrong here, but refinances and maturity play into this major lease, especially with funds. So, you know, five year, 10 year, 20 year maturities, like how should you be thinking through that if you don't necessarily know much about the banking market and about, you know, investing within a fund? What types of things should I be thinking through with, with refinances and maturity dates? Yeah. So obviously the big one is, you know, what if you're, your five-year term happens to be year five, your loan is maturing, and it's 2008. The market is, is in a free fall. No bank is wanting to lend on anything, let alone a trailer park. What's your backup plan? And right. if you ask a lot of GPs, the newer ones, they don't really have a backup plan. So that can be terrifying. And then the, the fund maturities, uh, like you said, you know, hey, it's a 10 year fund at the end of uh, the 10 year fund, we're going to liquidate and sell all the assets and, and realize the gains. Well, what if 10 years from now is 2008 and, and nobody has money, it's hard for buyers to get approved for financing. Obviously, you want to ask a question of the GP, you know, hey, what's your backup plans to that? And, you know, some of our backup plans that we have is we never do just a hard five year term. You know, it may be that the interest rate may be fixed for five years and then the, ter the rate turns to a, a variable loan, variable rate for another five years where you, you have some flexibility there. And then we may refi in three years, right? So I think just having that flexibility uh, kind of gives us a little, a little room there. And then I think when you're talking to a fund manager, you should ask the same thing. You know, hey, what if 10 years from now, it's a 10 year fund, you know, is there flexibility in your fund? to hold if it's not a, not a good time to sell and you want that flexibility instead of the, the latter. I love that because it comes down to this, are your incentives aligned? And if you have a 2008 situation happen and it's like, I don't know, maybe you have like an APREF, some type of split over that and you're really, really, really close to at least the, the fund is really, really, really close to returning all the capital. And it may not necessarily be the best time to refinance and have that event happen, uh, but they really want to hit their split, right? They really want to have their equity promote. Um, what types of things should you be looking out for as an LP beyond just, you know, maybe necessarily refinances and, and maturity dates on loans and just, you know, in general, like what types of things should you be looking out for in terms of keeping incentives aligned? Because Obviously, you want your GP to be very motivated, but at the same time, you don't want them chasing after a goal that doesn't necessarily benefit you. Yeah, I would say two things, really. One is, does the operator have skin in the game? Are they investing cash into the deal? Because that is one of, it's on my checklist. I always like to see that an operator uh, has some skin in the game, right? And, you know, also, are they signing recourse? I think that's a, I think it's a big deal, right? Because not only are they putting money in the, in the game, but they're also signing on the debt, you know, with their, you know, balance sheet uh, as well. So in addition to those things, I would say, you know, the preferred return structure is favorable to me uh, because you're, you're giving them the first, say it's 8%. You're giving, you're giving the investors the first 8% that that asset produces. And it puts their, you know, it, it, it puts their returns ahead of your own as a, as a GP. And it also incentivizes, you know, the GP to 
uh, hit that, uh, you know, to hit that promote, right? Where it, okay, like once we, so they're incentivized to pay back your initial capital as quickly as possible. So I think th that's just a couple things that you as, a, as an LP could look out for and to try to, you know, see if your deal includes those. So kind of a two for a question here that are related. Obviously, the SEC has rules around accredited investors and non-accredited investors. So I'd love to just kind of hear just your brief thoughts on that, because I, I would guess that we have a huge contingency of folks that listen in that are not accredited investors. And I believe for the most part, that's okay. And then either way, whether you're an accredited investor or not, what's a reasonable amount that you should be thinking through as a minimum investment? Yeah. So I would say that the minimum investment, you know, typically what I've seen is 50,000. And that's even in 506B or 506C type of funds or syndications. So that's, there's, there's rule 506, which has a B and a C to it. The B is for basically friends and family that are going to invest with you, that you have to prove you had some sort of relationship with them before they can invest with you. With the 506C, you can raise money through advertising on you know, various platforms and, and you know, how, however you want to advertise your deals to try to raise money. So, uh, you know, I would think that the 506C has, you know, a little more regulation around it uh, because of the marketing factors and, and it has to be accredited only investors in those uh, type of deals, uh, which means that, you know, you have to have a, a certain net worth and income, you know, to be able to participate uh, the 506B does have an allotment where you could accept, I believe it's 35 non-accredited, up to 35 non-accredited investors. However, a lot of syndicators will not allow unaccredited investors to even mm. invest in those deals just because it's considered more risky uh, to mm. prove that the investor was of sophisticated nature before they made that investment. So uh, there are a couple hurdles there uh, that you'll want to look into, but there is the ability, you know, to my knowledge, uh, with current, you know, rules from the SEC that if you are not accredited, a 506B syndication uh, is something you can invest in. That's a wonderful information for anyone listening and to, leaning towards going LP. Uh, I know this question is going to come, which is, all right, I've got 50 grand. Is an LP going to ever make me full time? full time so I can quit my job. Wow. You know, every deal's different, right? Um, you know, I would say it really depends. There's not like a, a straight answer on that. Uh, with 50,000, I think that's a, a little <laughs> aggressive, you know, I'll be honest. I like the, I like the, the, yeah. the, the nature of it, the, the, you know, the thought, but I think <laughs> that if you recycle the capital, your chances of that happening are much higher and people don't like that answer because it's not right. a quick and easy way to get rich, right? It's a slow and steady process. But if you're able to invest that capital with an operator that plans to add value to say a mobile home community and increase occupancy, you know, build back utilities, for example, and then within say five years, which I, I think this is realistic, uh, within five years, they're able to refinance and pay you back that 50,000 plus say a 10% cash on cash return per year. Then in five years, you've gotten your cash back. You, you know, you could still own the equity that you, you have in that said mobile home park. So you're still getting distributions on that cash flow, And then you can recycle the cash that you got back into another deal. You know, the more that you're able to participate in that and create something out of nothing, as Robert Kiyosaki says, uh, the, the better off your chances are to, uh, you know, create passive income that offset your expenses. Awesome. That was, by the way, that was a great answer. I'm not going to make you ask a really tough question without also answering it myself. <laughs> yes. A lot of folks listening in with plus or minus 50 grand. It's not a great spot to be if you want to go full time. Uh, LP is, is not necessarily the best way to do that. That being said, just like Andrew spelled out right there, 
you can recycle that capital and be right back in the game. 50 grand is, is not a lot. I remember when we had you on our podcast back in like 2017, you said you sold your truck to have the <laughs> earnest money deposit. So you were there with basically no money. I was there with basically no money. People like us can get our start. Like I said, I was an LP in, in our first deal ever. But what I did was we cashed out part of a finder's fee. So that way we had some capital so we can go and buy our second deal. So in other words, there are ways you can get started with your first deal being an LP, but just doing some basic math, let's say you have, let's say you have a 10 pref, let's just round up, just make math easy. If you have 50 grand, <laughs> the math ain't so great. That's like 5,000 bucks a year. If you have a million dollars, okay, a million dollars and you're doing an eight pref, that's 80,000 bucks a year passive, right? Assuming that they're going to hit their pref, right? So the question then is, is 80,000 bucks enough for you to go full time? I know plenty of people who say, no, that's not even close. I, I personally would have, I've took literally to go full time. I took less than half of that. <laughs> so it definitely depends on what you need to go full time. But, you know, for those listening in, I, I also wanted to answer that question too, not to leave Andrew all high and dry on that. But yeah, a lot of times in this space and life in general, you, the answer, you're not going to like it. And the question is, are you going to create a delusion around that and tell yourself one thing and then never actually get started because you're kind of lying to yourself? Or are you going to go, you know what, that really hurts to hear. And I don't like to hear that, but okay, that's what the market is telling me. Now it's on me to decide if I have what it takes to make the sacrifices to get there. So yes, um, it can't. So long story short, it can be done, but realistically speaking, if you want to get full time in mobile home parks, you've got to find your way into the GP spot or at least, you know, like Ian and I did find an awesome operator to partner with on your first or second deal um, to go from there. Um, Andrew, talk to us briefly about the difference between if I'm investing in a fund and I'm just investing in, you know, just a syndication, just like a one-off one mobile home park syndication. Sure. So, you know, a one-off syndication would be typically investing in a single property. And the benefits to that are that, you know, you will know the property ahead of time. So you can, you know, analyze the details, analyze the market, look at the property specific details that you're provided to determine if you think if that, if you think that that deal is a home run or not, because you're, you're flat out seeing the property, you're getting the address, you're seeing what's being purchased. Now an investment fund you're more so buying into a business plan or, or investing into a business plan where they may say, Hey, we're going to buy, you know, mobile home parks above a hundred lots in, you know, primary markets uh, across the Southeast. You know, that could be the fund business plan that you're you know, investing in. So now you could invest, you know, halfway through the fund and, you know, they have, the fund has already purchased some properties. So you may be able to, you know, see some of the properties that the fund has acquired. Uh, but typically you're not going to know going in exactly what real estate is being purchased, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't really have seen very many funds basically trying to recapitalize an existing portfolio. It's usually forward looking. So there's definitely pros and cons to each. Tell me, cause I don't want to belabor that cause there's, uh, I'm sure you go into an amazing detail on your podcast. Tell me this. So one day I aspire to be an LP. So I'm still in growth mode. I'm still wanting to be GP of my own deals. But one day I want to be an LP on my own. How can I be a good LP? Because what I don't want to do is be the guy where you see my phone number ringing and you just go, oh, no. <laughs> what are some do's and don'ts for, for LPs? That's a, that's a really, really good question. And I would narrow it down to a few things, right? So the first thing is, is when you're trying to talk to a GP, instead of firing off questions, you know, three emails a day, you know, a couple calls, instead of trying, you know, answer, you know, asking all of these questions via a variety of, of different methods, if you could, you know, put them together in a single platform, 
or in a single notepad and then set up a call or maybe put it in one email and ask your questions in one format, that would just save a lot of time for the GPs to have to respond at, you know, to several different you know, formats of communication. So that's just one easy thing that you can do. Uh, the second thing uh, is you know, get as educated as you can on the space, right? So uh, you should, you know, and this is something that you know, my podcast may help with is just educating you on you know, how business plans for acquiring mobile home parks, you know, what the typical you know, terms are and so forth. Because you know, a, a lot of GPs, uh, you know, they will take time to educate you and kind of, you know, help, help show you why mobile home parks are a good investment. But, but typically, you know, we kind of would expect someone to know ahead of time, hey, this is how this kind of works. So just being familiar with real estate private equity in, in the, the slightest also is helpful. Um, and then, you know, one thing that a handful of, of our LP investors have done is after they've invested with us, they offer to be a reference for future investors and they refer future, you know, other, uh, you know, people that are interested in syndications to us. So uh, that obviously gives, gives you a, you know, gives you brownie points, I guess, with the, with the, the operator and, you know, they're, they're obviously, you know, up in that VIP list of investors that kind of get to see deals first. So that would be a couple of tips. I love that because you're basically saying bring value beyond money. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like it's bring value beyond money because I think a lot of folks, they, and I understand this, this is a fortune to them, whether it's 10,000 bucks or a million bucks, it's a big portion of their investment stack and they have the right and they should be asking some tough questions. Right. Yes. But there is a dance between being between asking some really good questions that need to be asked and just, just being annoying. <laughs> Cause I I've got to be honest, a big reason why I don't take on outside capital is because I don't want to deal with it. I really, I really just don't. And you know, that's probably stunted my growth and I'm honestly fine with that. Cause I have a lot of fun doing what I do, but um, it, it, I got to tell you, it's, being on the GP side, I know how you feel and others feel. And I just would want to be the best LP possible. And I love that, you know, bringing value where you can, and then just stepping back where you are just kind of being annoying or think you're being helpful, but not really. And, and also just being a good partner in general. So I love that. What, um, and also, by the way, I want to second what you said earlier about getting organized and then putting something on the calendar because calling someone out of the blue, <laughs> if they're good and they're really busy, they hate that. That's a bad thing. That's they've got 8,000 things going on, right? Book some time on the calendar. If, uh, if they're just answering your calls out of nowhere, that can also be a really, really bad sign. A red flag, right? Because you know, you're investing in an operator that buys, acquires and manages, you know, these assets, you know, a portion of their time is for investor relations, not all of the time. So it definitely helps if you can just be organized and, and set up a time. And, and most, most investors that invest with us are, are they, they abide by that. And it, it's really extremely helpful. Andrew, I thoroughly enjoyed this, man. For everyone listening in, I'm going to drop his um, podcast link in the show notes. So that way y'all can just click on it and go right to it. Anything else that really should we should mention before we break away for this episode andrew yeah i would say just be careful and you know there are operators out there that you know have made mistakes and there's a lot of uh you know it's 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 a big deal right so i would just make sure to vet an operator up front and you know do some proper due diligence uh I, I get it. It's an extra step and it, it's, it's extra time that you have to dedicate to it. Uh, but it is amazing to me how much money is wired into our accounts with only talking to someone for 10 minutes prior. And it's, it oh, scares man. me because I just like, oh, no. it's a lot of money and, and yeah. it's, 
it's worth doing a little due diligence, talking to a reference, mm. taking that extra step uh, just to safeguard yourself. So that would be my advice. What's that quote? Uh, it's something like a fool and his money are easily parted. Yeah, that's, that's, terif- that's terrifying. Hey, we had a good call. Here's a million bucks. That's terrifying. It's it's a lot of money, and you know I just don't want to see anybody get taken advantage of. So uh, important. That's why that's why I felt it was imperative to have you on, man. I think you're doing wonderful you. things for our space, and I think the way we make our space better is we help others, even if we don't necessarily directly benefit from it. I think you and I, with our respective podcasts, are trying to to make this space better. So anything I can do. You let me know. I got your back, man. And I want to just end on this. You can't teach hunger. You can't do it. People are, people either want it or they don't. You know, I quit my job to quite literally go and live in a mobile home park for 14 months. Ian actually, before we moved into that mobile home park, moved in with my parents in my old bedroom. You know, you sold your truck. You loved that truck and you sold your truck so you could have that earnest money deposit. Some of, some of my mentees have blown me away. One of which is actually just arrived to his mobile home park in, in Iowa from Florida in the middle of the winter. Wow. <laughs> which That's is wild. crazy. And he's, he's just like, man, I heard what you and Ian did and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm like, that amazing. I may, whatever yeah. I can do, you, you let me know. And I've got another mentee who just, he, he, he makes me uncomfortable the amount he's willing to sacrifice to, to, chase his mobile home park dreams. So if, you know, you can't teach that. People either are willing to make the sacrifices and chase their dreams or they're not. And you can't teach that. And I don't know how you can find that, bottle it and scale it. Because if you could, then you would be a billionaire. But to me, if you can obviously vet accordingly, like you're saying, if you can add some way somehow to find out if somebody is really willing to do what it takes that's to your quote earlier where you're like a good operator and a bad market can make money and a, and, and then the opposite's true, right? Good market, bad operator can lose money. Uh, Andrew, it's been awesome having you here, man. I could keep you on for hours, but I think this was the optimal amount of time. Dude, thank you so much for coming on. Hey, thank you so much for having me. And I did want to make sure we said, you know, yeah. it was a, a good operator in a, in a, a bad piece of real estate. Now the market obviously will play a a lot of factors, but the piece of real estate being purchased, you know, sometimes the uglier it is, the the better, you know, the, the potential. So uh, I really appreciate you having me, Ryan. Thank you so much. And uh, you know, we'll be, we'll talk again soon. Rock on dude. Thanks again.